Great. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the Tuesday, December 13th uh, meeting of the Science and Data Subcommittee of the Vermont Climate Council. We've got um, a meeting on the calendar uh, starting at 10 a.m. and then going until noon today. Um, the agenda is linked on the calendar. Colin also just helpfully put it in the, in the chat. Um, so the plan for today is to uh, discuss um, our, our minutes and uh, um, I would say just approve them, but um, we actually have some questions about that that we'll get into. Um, and then we have a number of, of updates and discussion items. Um, before we dive in, I did wanna just see if anybody having looked at the agenda um, has any other um, items that um, you are <laughs> hoping to um, address or add to the agenda. We do have some time for that towards the end for miscellaneous items, but it might be good just to have a sense of if anyone is has anything in particular that they um, want to address that isn't uh, explicitly mentioned on the draft agenda that Colin and I shared. Richard. Uh, I don't see any mention of the biomass task group. Um, and maybe that's intended to come up under liaison. Uh, that'd be fine. That would be great. Sounds good. Okay. Um, any anything else? Great suggestion, Richard. Um, so, Colin, do you want to um, talk about the the minutes? Sure, I'm happy to do that, Jared. Um, so, I. I honestly can't recall um, who, if anybody, was was taking the minutes for the last meeting. Um, I did not get. I was I was going to try to do them just before this meeting, but I did not get to it. So, I I am happy to kind of look at the recording and get those ready for approval um, at at the next meeting. And uh, apologies, I I didn't get to that before this meeting. But um, so yeah, well, I've been doing a lot of inventory work. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I think it's also kind of totally understandable because we've we've gone through this shift that we weren't used to where previously there was rotating state staff taking minutes and and now there's no, that's no longer the case. Um, well, sometimes it's the case, but I guess we're asking for rotating subcommittee volunteers to take uh, minutes. Um, does anybody have a different recollection than Colin? Does anybody recall having actually taken the minutes last time, or do we have to go through that step of going back and rewatching the recording uh, to generate them and then at, seek to have them approved at the next meeting? Okay. Well, um, I, th I think we will do that. Um, but for purposes of today, so we make sure we're not in the same situation at our next meeting, um, would welcome a volunteer to uh, take take minutes for this meeting and to then share with Colin and I after so we can share that as part of the next agenda. And everybody all at once. And, uh, you know, I think that given the number of folks we have, um, probably we won't have to have more than one per one time a year do it. So um, anybody wants to just get it over with and is conveniently set up to Jared, if I'm if I'm doing the previous one, I can I will probably just wait and look at the recording of this one as well, rather than trying to do them um, real time. But um, but if if nobody else um, feels yeah, like doing it's it today, difficult to chair the meeting <laughs> and track the agenda and record minutes at the same time. So um, okay, well, hearing uh, nothing from <laughs> the floor, um, then. Maybe we'll we'll plan for that then uh, for now, just so we can move forward. But it's not too late if somebody does want to help out and volunteer. Uh, 
I'll do the minutes. <laughs> I was, I, I mean, it seemed like somebody was going to break in there somewhere, but. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Jared. I, I have to say, not everybody will get this reference, but the way you said that, it sounded to me exactly like that old Dunkin' Donuts commercial. Time to make the donuts. Yeah, I wish I was making <laughs> donuts, but I'll, I'll make some minutes. Thank you. Um, Colin, do you want to take this uh, next uh, item on the agenda of the discussion of the next meeting date and time? Unmuting would probably be a good idea. Um, yes, I, I'm happy to, to do that, Jared. Um, I think maybe this will be kind of uh, more of a group discussion, I guess, but um, but in, in going into the new year, um, I, I believe the idea was to kind of, I'm happy to send out another poll, um, but to, to kind of find a new recurring, recurring time and day of the week. Um, and also maybe to discuss kind of the, the frequency of meetings. Um, so yeah, I guess maybe I will, I'll open it up or Jared, if you have particular thoughts on that as well. But um, yeah, I think that's, that's where I'll leave it. Maybe as a starting point, Colin, are you able to share what the results of this, the poll were? Um, I can, but it was just, that was just kind of, for this date. Okay, so we need so, to do another one starting for starting in January. I think so for for a recurring, yeah, for a recurring day. I'm I'm assuming that this time does not always work for people, but if if that is not correct, let me know and I'm happy to happy to use those poll results um going forward. Yeah, it seems like at least for our, the folks who are joining from schools, colleges, universities, having academic schedules change, it might be good to, to have a fresh one that can kind of cover the, the winter and spring semesters. Um, yeah. I, I guess I'll also just ask, sorry to interrupt you, Jerry, but, um, but on, on the meeting frequency, do we have, we have a thought on on how often this group wants to meet or I, it seems like maybe that would be almost better to have a little bit variable or or schedule for i don't know if it's better to schedule it for less frequently and have try to schedule ones in between as things come up um it just seems like the the frequency really kind of depends on what happens to be going on at the time um and sometimes there's kind of a lot of a lot going on that this group would be helpful to have input on, and other times it's a little bit slower. So, Julie, please, please go ahead. Just offer sort of two thoughts or reaction. One is, at least selfishly, it's very helpful to have time blocked on the calendar and given back rather than trying to find it. That said, Colin, I think your your comment about how much engagement and it's it's going to be i think a little bit more episodic as rfps and probably more to the point going forward deliverables come in and this group may want to take them up and discuss them um but i think having a standing meeting and and a you know general broad agreement to to cancel absent um some specific task at hand uh makes the most sense in my regard and it may be just depending on timing, um, I see Jane turned on her calendar. And maybe she wants to weigh in on this too. Um, that that we may actually need more frequent meetings occasionally, but I think having a, a monthly cadence sort of held on the on the calendar makes a lot of a lot of sense. Yeah, I was I was going to echo what Julie was suggesting and um, just reference that you know today's meeting likely, except for biomass, can be relatively quick and we can give updates, but all of those contractual updates have roles and responsibilities for science and um, data subcommittee members on task groups. And as those start to pick up, um, understanding what the work of this group will be around those contracts will be important. And I did just want to note, um, you know, there's also this period of transition right now on the council, unclear of sort of like um, Dr. Leslie Ann Dupini-Drew is one of the House Appointment Counselors. I'm not sure 
um, if she's stepping off the council or continuing on and then also thinking about um, roles and responsibilities of subcommittee members in the face of new uh, counselors coming on. So just want to highlight that, you know, and hopefully a meeting later in January that we'll see clarity in that space around who is a counselor. And then also contracts will come in line and we could be more clear on the timeline and deliverables. But I think Julie's right, just setting that monthly meeting and then um, backing out or providing email updates when there isn't a need to come together is probably the best way to move forward. That sounds great to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just offer that it sounds like, you know, there are a lot of these really key pieces of research and analysis that have been kind of a long time coming in terms of the design and the writing of the RFP and the selection of the consultant and the, uh, you know, the, the timeline and deliverables that that are, that seem like they're all going to be getting underway <laughs> at a at a similar time. There's a lot of a lot of important work and activity that's going to be happening in the coming months. So I. I agree that I think it'll be an important opportunity for us to come back and share updates, even if a lot of that work is happening in task groups. Sorry, I did just want to mention one thing. It jogged my memory, Maine, uh, Jane. Um, Leslie Ann sent me an email just before this meeting saying that she was, uh, she apologized, but she was not going to be able to make this meeting, but um, wanted to say she would catch up afterwards um, on the video and say happy holidays to everybody. So wanted to share that before I forgot. <laughs> Sorry, one other comment about like work planning and workload for conversation in January is, and Colin can give more detailed update um, on this, but um, um, well, one, maybe I could um, use this moment to say that Colin has accepted and officially <laughs> a position in the Climate Action Office and will be shifting from the Air Quality and Climate Division to the Climate Action Office as our climate change uh, progress and data um, analyst. And so Colin will be shifting into the office um, in the next, hopefully with the next pay period. Um, so in the next week or so. So we're really excited to officially have Colin shifting into that role. Um, Colin can speak to this, of, of course, in more detail, but he's currently working on the um, greenhouse gas inventory um, at, that will catch us up, sort of speak, for the last three years of 2018, 19, and 20 data. Um, and then we're going to be working on a clear expectation methodology around um, a delivery date and how we put out the inventory consistently um, going forward, uh, understanding that as we get closer to our emissions reduction requirements statutorily, there needs to be a clear expectation from the council, the public uh, folks about when the inventory will be pu published and set in a deadline annually. And um, we're thinking a lot about the role of the science, we, or we, I shouldn't say a lot, but we've started to think about the role of the science and data as subcommittee in that process, especially for methodology changes and check-ins. Um, and so as a public process, um, so that'll be a really important component, I think of your work going forward. Um, and then also wanted to highlight that as Colin shifts into um, this new role, we also finally have the added capacity needed to advance the measuring and assessing progress uh, tool RFP that we've had drafted for a while, the RFP, but haven't actually moved forward um, because of capacity constraints. Um, and so we'll be looking to advance that relatively quickly in the new year. And clearly that will be um, a big role of this subcommittee as it was in setting up the framework for that tool for the climate action plan. So I just wanted to highlight there, there is work happening, work to come and Colin's clear transfer now really gives us the green light to move on things that we need to do. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, I, I missed it. Welcome. Colin, can you repeat your new the, the new title? Oh, man, Jared, I don't remember what it is yet. Jane, do you know how I'm talking about? <laughs> Progress and data analyst, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> climate change, climate change progress, progress and data, and data analysts. Yeah. And I'll drop in a really exciting moment for us is that we're now on the Secretary's Office website, the Climate Action Office. I'll drop the website in the chat. So we appear as a real office now, um, and we're undergoing some changes to our website, the climatechange.vermont.gov, which will orient 
the work of the climate office and the work um, of the different programmatic areas that we'll be touching on and that will roll out um, hopefully in January. Colin's title is on the on the page though, so if he needs to check, he can check there for what he's called. <laughs> Thanks, Gene. <laughs> so just to kind of finish the conversation about um, schedule, what I was hearing as suggestions and what it's I was seeing thumbs up and nodding heads for, but just want to check for consensus is that we would um, have a scheduling poll to identify a, a recurring monthly uh, meeting time that you know, we can scale back or, or cancel if necessary, but it would be good to have a standing monthly meeting, probably aim for the first one to be towards the end of January, which probably mean that future ones would come towards the end of month, just so that there's more um, uh, time for some of these projects to get underway and more progress to report on a lot of the task groups. Does that sound good to everybody? Did I hear that right? All right, then I think we can go on to the uh, contractual work updates. Um, Megan or Jane, do you want to? Sorry, one second. Here, uh, we have a we have a a note in the chat. Um, if uh, anyone who this time doesn't work for in general. Um, oh, I thought we were going to do a new poll, but we can. Yeah, we can start I, with I was it. just. Oh, sorry, folks. It's Elizabeth. Yeah, I threw that in there. This this time works for me. That's all I was thinking. So I thought we would just check that. Just check that first. Is there anyone who, you know, do we need a new poll? And then if so, sure. But this time might work. Just a thought. Sure. The people we need to hear from are the people who aren't here. Yeah, Tara is not here and Leslie Ann's not here. Um, maybe some others um so just to make sure we're capturing people who aren't here i, I think i'd lean towards wanting to just do a new poll okay but yes i'll, I'll certainly include this time um on in, in the new poll options but i appreciate the um question, Elizabeth, it would have been nice if we had everyone here, we could just say yes and not go through that. But um, so uh, first on the list for the contractual work updates is the life cycle analysis. Megan or Jane, do you want to? I got um, a punch list this morning from our business office on our three contracts that have been with the business office. So I probably have the most up-to-date information on three of the contracts today um, and can start with that update on those three. And then I know Brian and Megan are here and Colin can speak specifically to the agricultural one um, so folks can fill in the gaps. But um, the first contract, um, the first of the, two of the three contracts you all remember have sort of um, been out there. We posted the RFPs and have been moving towards contractual relationships since earlier in the summer, maybe even late spring for the life cycle analysis and the municipal vulnerability index. Um, and there have just been really sort of um, serious um, constraints in our business office that are sort of unparalleled that we've not experienced before because of real challenges um, throughout the agency. So I just want to highlight that it wasn't just sort of like state bureaucracy churning its wheels. We've had real issues. And so things have just taken time, but we're finally sort of able to move that log jam. And it feels really exciting to start to get these contracts underway. Um, and the life cycle analysis one um, and the municipal vulnerability index contracts have had final legal review and final business office review. And um, we had been waiting on some issues with their certificate of insurance um, getting um, approved because they weren't, it, it, I'll just say, I think because we're not actually under contract yet, I cannot reveal the name of the consultant, um, but we should be under contract this week with both of them. And it's the same consultant actually doing the municipal vulnerability index and the life cycle analysis, ironically. 
Um, and they have, it is a big consulting firm um, who have different wings and, and different expertise and their firm really did step up and provide excellent proposals and were selected as the lead consultant by uh, the task group that consisted of folks from this subcommittee, rural resilience, um, as well as just transitions. Um, and Ag and Eco also helped support the life cycle analysis one. And so um, those contracts all um, were rebuilt based on the constraints within um, the business office to um, have deliverables that were uh, based on the execution date and things will start to move relatively quickly once we get them. And the life cycle analysis in particular um, is intended, I believe, to be completed by the, we're supposed to have drafts very quickly on different components and then completely done the contract by the end of the summer. So we should have that work going soon. Um, and there's uh, some interesting uh, components built into it around how we think about traditional ecological knowledge and how we do stakeholder engagement and public engagement on those contracts. So looking forward to working with the task group again um, on reviewing deliverables and considering how we roll that work out. So apologies for the delay, but Municipal Vulnerability Index and the life cycle analysis should be under contract before the holidays. So I'll, I'll pause on those and just make sure everybody's familiar. Um, I know some of you are newer subcommittee members, but I'll just say that both the life cycle analysis and the municipal vulnerability index are requirements of the GWSA. Um, they are components of work that ANR has committed to continuing through. Um, and yeah, they've been sort of outstanding for a while. I guess one question I have, Jane, is, is I am not as familiar with the municipal vulnerability index um rfp and the responses to it but i am familiar with the life cycle analysis one and you know my recollection is that there was a, a pretty ambitious timeline that was in the original um rfp and in the responses received and i'm just wondering given these delays in the, the with the business office to what extent you have had or anyone else has had conversations with the contractors about ways in which those timelines may need to be adjusted so that we can, whether it's to to, to do the due diligence and, and proper work on, on public engagement and framing up, or just the, the time that it's gonna take to do the work and the analysis and have it reviewed. Can you just speak to if or how conversations about timelines shifting may have happened or to what degree that will be a topic when the task groups convene and have the kind of initial framing and, you know, conversations with the selected consultant. Yeah, so the, um, the light, both of the contracts um, have the deliverables uh, baked into phases of the contract and the deliverables are built out based on, um, based on the period of weeks that they said they needed, not on dates. So based on the execution date, um, then they have, if they said originally that it was going to be a month, um, we gave them a month from execution date. So everything's sort of built back now from based on the execution of the contract. So it's still aggressive in that they'll complete it in the same period of time, but just further out based on the delay in executing the contract. Got it. Got it. Ken. Yeah, my question is, are there... Uh, are there formal work groups associated with uh, each of the contracts we're going to be talking about today? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, I the uh, life cycle analysis one is that all of them sort of carried over from either right after. Uh, either carried over from the climate action plan process or were newly formed after the climate action plan was adopted to support the work going forward. Okay. Thanks. And, and I don't, Marion could probably remind me, but I don't know if we actually maintain, we maintain list of the subcommittees, but it probably would be important and we can think about doing this for each one, um, supporting a list of who sits on each task group and maintaining that on the website too, because that's 
a lot of the work is really grounding, it is really happening at the task group level now on implementation. And so being transparent about who's sitting on that and who's influencing that work, we'd be happy to produce that, I'm sure, and post it on the website. Yeah, we don't maintain that in part because they're not, you know, public meetings and public groups. So beyond transportation and biomass, which are meeting publicly, we don't have those lists, but I agree it would be helpful to have that list somewhere. I just had one other question on the life cycle analysis, connecting back to a previous um, point that you brought up, Jane, about the next inventory and the schedule for that. And so I don't know if this is a question for you or Colin, but you know, I think we we talked about last year um, in the analysis that went into the climate action plan and the pathways when we were when we were talking about um, emissions analysis going forward, wanting to see a sensitivity analysis um, kind of addendum or addition um, uh, so that, and, and so I'm just wondering, is, is the timing such that at this point you're planning to wait and release the next inventory until such time as we can have a sensitivity analysis added to it? Or are you planning to release the inventory under just the existing methodology and perhaps with some other sensitivity analysis is analyses that are able to be done, but not the life cycle? And I guess I'm just wondering, is, will the life cycle and ana sensitivity analysis apply to 2020 backward with the next report? Or are you planning to wait and do that with 2021 backward? I'm just wondering what the current thinking of the timing is and how the life cycle project uh, influences that. Sure, I, I can speak to that, Jared, unless you want to jump in, Jane. But um, yes, we, we're planning to release the inventory kind of without just because because of the kind of delay in the life cycle um, contract process, it wasn't going to really be feasible to wait that long to release the next version of the inventory. So, so the plan right now is to release the inventory more or less with the same, but but some sensitivities built in there, as as you mentioned, Jared, um, for some of the other pieces, but not the life cycle piece. And then when the life cycle piece comes out, yes, probably put that as as an appendix, as an attachment sensitivity to the next iteration. Um, that's our that's our thinking right now. Ken, is that a new hand or is that your the previous hand up? Old hand, going away. Thanks. Okay, so I think then um, we can move to the ag emissions update and then uh, have Brian and or Jane on tap for the uh, thermal sector report update. Sure, I can I can give the ag sector or the ag RFP update. Um, so we have, as, as our Ag Task Group um, reviewed, we had two proposals um, from, that, from that RFP. Um, we've reviewed them and we have, we've selected a contractor, but in that selection process, we, um, we talked through some of it and talked through the proposal and decided to narrow the scope of that proposal a little bit um, so that the work was more focused on the actual evaluation of tools and data sets and really making sure it was a little bit deeper dive into kind of the Vermont specific, more local data sets. Um, and since it's not, not a large amount of money for this contract um, to kind of cut out the, the phase three, which was the actual in the creation of the inventory um, using that tool and with the hope that potentially that could be done as a separate contract later, but, or that maybe we could do it in house, depending on the tool and the level of effort that it would require for the tool and the data sets, frankly. Um, so we, we've had a little bit of a back and forth with the contractor and they've submitted a new updated proposal. And um, we are going to be meeting on that. I can pull up my calendar, but I think it was, is it a week or two, Jane? Is that right? 
Okay, yeah, to, to kind of make the final determination there. Sorry, go ahead, Jane. No, just I was confirming next week, the task group's getting together. Great, thank you. Um, and at this point, the task group has really just deferred to the Ag Agency and ANR to just ensure that the revised proposal does what we wanted it to do. And I think, I know Colin has reviewed it closely and thinks that the contractor has met what we'd like them to do. And so knowing that we're working in good faith with the Ag Agency, um, we're just waiting to confirm from the Ag Agency that they're supportive. Um, yeah. And for folks who don't, and I think every, for folks who haven't been as intimately connected to this work from the onset, this has really been a recognition um, throughout the climate action plan process, or or I shouldn't say recognition, but a question that was raised throughout the climate action plan process around um, the tool, the SIT tools applicability for the ag sector and whether or not it really, if there are better tools out there that cal can calculate gross emissions more refined, or um, certainly, I know if, if there are tools out there that can look at growth and net emissions um, and then think about how we apply or consider changes to the inventory based on those that review of the tools. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, Jane. Does anybody have any questions or any thoughts they'd like to share after hearing that update? Okay, I think it's on to Ryan or Jane on the update on the uh, thermal sector report. Um, Brian um, has helped support drafting the contract for the buildings and thermal decarbonization. And for um, since Elizabeth appreciates my context, I'll give it to you all again on this one too. Um, this is a, a contract that re, um, refuse, uh, reviews and reflects on, first and foremost, was put forward in response to the governor's veto of the clean heat standards, but trying to review and look at um, policies um, broader than the clean heat standard, but hoping and appreciating that the clean heat standard will likely rise to the top in that suite of scenarios of the most effective policies and most cost-effective policies in decarbonizing the buildings and thermal sectors. Um, we had, um, I believe, two excellent proposals in that space as well. Um, Brian had, did a great job of helping uh, to learn from my challenges in drafting the municipal vulnerability and life cycle analysis contracts. And um, we got the AOK -okay with some minor changes I made this morning on the buildings and thermal contract. So um, that contract is approved by the business office. And today I just have to get an updated insurance um, certificate and a W-9 from the contractor. And that one is on track to be executed um, before the holidays as well. And so for folks who don't know that the first ask of that contract will be due two weeks after execution of the contract. And it will do sort of a rough um, review and analysis of the different policy options based on research that has already been done. And so we'll have sort of something to go into the legislative session with and actually have um, a basis for moving forward and determining the scenarios that we want to advance and analyze over the course of the next six months. So excited to say that we're so close on that one too. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Anything else about contractual work happening? And um, if anybody just has any questions about it, I know that we have some folks on the uh, committee who've um, been involved in designing these scopes of work and, and folks for whom the, it, these are totally new. So I think it's, it would be a great time now if anybody has any clarifying questions. Thanks, Jane, for providing all the good background context as you spoke about them. Um, otherwise, I think that we can move to the updates from subcommittee liaisons. Um, and Richard, since you um, 
um, had suggested an update from uh, the biomass task group. I wonder if you'd be willing to, to kick us off with that. Sure. Um, I have been sitting on this biomass task group together with people from the Just Transition Subcommittee, the Ag and Eco Subcommittee, the Cross-Sector Mitigation Subcommittee um, for, for the best part of the last year. Uh, we started sometime last spring. We heard from uh, a lot of really excellent experts. Uh, well, let me back up a little bit. The, the scope of the biomass task group um, was restricted to burning biomass to generate electricity. It did not include burning biomass to generate heat. It was out of scope for this, this uh, task group's work. It, it grew out of the fact that the Ag and Ecosystems Subcommittee was, was unable to uh, make a, a clear consensus-based recommendation to the council about what to do about uh, electric generating plants that run on biomass. And so the, the, the question of what the recommendation should be from the council about, on that topic was, was referred to this sort of ad hoc task group to, to work on. So we heard from uh, people from the forestry industry, people from academic foresters. We heard from uh, economists, environmental scientists, um, the people who regulate air quality in ANR, um, probably some others that I haven't thought of. It was, um, if you were to go back and review the, the uh, the archived uh, recordings, video recordings of the meetings of the biomass task group, you would get an education on this topic, um, as as did the members of the of the task group. We we hammered out a set of recommendations, which are phrased as recommendations from the council, for presentation to the council at their meeting that was supposed to be yesterday, um, but that meeting was has been postponed. Uh, Liz Miller was to was to present the recommendations of the biomass task group to the to the full council yesterday, and I guess it will happen whenever the council uh, gets its make up meeting scheduled. the 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 biomass task group was in agreement that we shouldn't be building any new biomass burning electric generating plants. We were in agreement that the two existing plants, Rygate and McNeil ought not to be expanded. We were split down the middle on the question of how, um, how soon should the existing plants be uh, phased out and replaced with alternative ways to generate electricity. Um, some of us thought that we should hurry up the decommissioning of those plants and, and the repurposing of the plants. I just thought that there was probably a long-term role for those plants in our electricity generating mix and that we shouldn't be in any big hurry. The, 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 the document, which is um, available on, uh, as, a, as a meeting, uh, meeting document for the most recent meeting of the task group, and it's probably somewhere else too, that's where I found it, um, has a number of recommendations. Um, the, it, it, it recommends that we should... Uh, that the council should commission a similar task group to look at, at uh, biomass burning for heat, um, that we should, we, that the life cycle analysis that is currently contracted for, which we discussed earlier in this meeting, ought to, uh, ought to uh, address this question of um, biomass, both for electricity and for, uh, and for building heat. Uh, we recommended uh, a health study. Um, the, the, there, was a, there was a sense on the group that even though the plants operate within the parameters of their ANR permits, that there may still be adverse health effects from the particulates and other uh, matter that is emitted from the smokestacks in, the, in proximity to residential neighborhoods, particularly Winooski in the, the old north end of, of Burlington. Um, we we pre we presented two alternative um, um, phrasings for this question of um, 
how quickly the phase out ought to happen. One option was that, we, we, that, that uh, the state must advance an evidence-based study immediately to be completed expeditiously by an independent expert that would be managed within the Climate Action Office in conjunction with public service. The study should include, option one says, investigation of when and how and if, depending on the study results, to phase out Vermont's two existing uh, biomass electric facilities. And then the option two is investigation of when and how to phase out Vermont's two existing biomass plants. So option two assumes that um, that a phase out will happen. Option one uh, leaves open the question of whether that phase out will happen. So um, both Jane and uh, Colin Smythe have uh, participated in all these deliberations. And if I've misstated something or left something important out, please uh, please chime in. I think you covered it, Richard. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks for listening. Yeah, Elizabeth, please. Um, fascinating update. Thank you. I, I just wanted to say that um, probably many of you know that that this question of biomass came before Burlington City Council uh, earlier this week. And, um, you know, they're looking at there's a new decarbonization policy that's being developed by BED and, and a number of others. Um, another, uh, other stakeholders, and, and so they're, they're looking at this question of biomass, of course, because of McNeil. And Darren Springer, the general manager of BED, referenced a big study they did on health impacts, um, right in line with what, what you're thinking about, Richard. So um, there's probably some, some work that's been done that could be useful in, in bringing into this, this question as you start to explore it and try to understand it. Um, but I think for all of us, that was kind of another thing I wanted to flag. I'm, I'm sure you're all kind of watching what's happening in Burlington, but it um, is, is certainly interesting, very aggressive work happening on decarbonization that, um, that we, we might be able to learn something from and, and um, you know, uh, the study is underway that, that might be helpful for us at some point. Great. Thank you so much for that, Elizabeth. Anybody else have any questions or thoughts they want to share on that update? Elizabeth, um, is is there a, 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 does the does a, a meeting like that discussion that you just described is there a video posted of that somewhere, or can can one access that access yes. that? Yes. 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 Um, I would stick it. Um, I'll try to find it and stick it in the chat. But yeah, all the city council meetings are recorded, so you could find you could find that discussion um, there. It's recorded. Yep. That We're sounds very interesting. There. Thank you. Yeah, it really was. And he, I have to say, he um, he was asked about biomass and echoed almost exactly what you said. Liz Miller's recommendation was going to be. Um, so he came to the, he and his team came to almost the same conclusion around Rygate and McNeil and, and how to be thinking about it. So um, yeah, there's some, certainly some, some things to, we can be maybe perhaps helping each other understand these issues. Yeah, Jane, please. I want maybe just for Elizabeth to uh, just draw, draw your attention to hopefully you see in the chat, there is the draft recommendations, um, which speak to the uh, thermal uh, loop for BED and specifically for McNeil, I should say, and about sort of the questions that would wanna be asked by the Climate Council to make that case around um, sort of continuing to operate McNeil if there was thermal um, energy realized. And I just wanted to highlight maybe for your own interest, knowing that um, you work at UBM, one of the ongoing conversations in that task group around sort of the equity considerations of um, creating um, district heat from McNeil has been the uh, challenge um, of the fact that that heat would not be realized by the 
communities that bear the disproportional impact of McNeil's um, air quality considerations, and that would actually go up to UVM instead. And that has been sort of a criticism, I'll just say, from the equity folks on the task group um, around sort of the push to make, to close the loop with the thermal efficiency. That just, and I just wonder if, and I, I'm interested in watching the city council meeting. I've heard a bunch about it already, but interested in just understanding if and how that will get any traction from people who are watching that. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Um, I'll definitely take a look at that. I think right now, I think you're talking about the new project, right? Jane, the proposed project to bring the steam up basically yeah. up the hill. Yeah. It's my understanding that UVM, well, it's, it's, UVM Medical Center has is a partner in this project. I think UVM is moving a bit more slowly. Um, still, the, the the issue still stands. But anyway, um, yeah, thank you for flagging that. That's underway right now. Those conversations. And in terms of next steps from the the council, um, I guess my expectation would be that we basically have the, the same agenda that was crafted for the meeting that was postponed on Monday will will be the same agenda once that meeting can get rescheduled. So for folks who are interested um, in that topic would encourage you to join the next council meeting. I don't have a sense of the the timeline for when that may be able to be rescheduled. I would look to Jane. I don't know if we've heard any update from the, the House side. I think the main issue is the appointments or reappointment of the house appointed members of the council. Um, but I have not heard any of I them. Think we're, I think that the only, we will wait until the house appointments are made um, and that, that I'm a little anxious might drag on now at the start of the legislative session. Um, I, I do appreciate that if that happens quickly, we should move forward with the agenda as planned, but regardless, I expect some version of the council will need to meet before the legislative report um, yes. has to be due in. So if we don't, there's the, the council can meet with it because quorum is counted based on counselors. And so you could meet at least to approve the legislative report, but I don't think we, we would ever take it. We would take up business right. substantive without the full appointment of the council. So hopefully we'll see what that, happens as it, if it tags on. <laughs> yeah, because I think the combined Senate and administration appointees are what, like 14 of the 23 counselors. And we, we need them. One House appointment, Bram Kleppner, I believe I actually reached out yesterday um, to the speaker's staff because he was appointed after um, another seat was vacated for manufacturing. So my question was, was he appointed for now a three-year term and did it start on, I don't have a letter, so like it's hard to know. And so I think Bram is technically still a counselor and, and seven others are off, but yeah, we've never, the A&R didn't receive appointing letters for all the counselors. So it's not something we've tracked closely and I now would like to have it all in file for us. So I'm trying to get that. All right, let's let's move to some other liaison updates. Um, maybe I'll just go through the subcommittees and see if there are folks from those subcommittees who are uh, available to give any relevant updates if they have if they've met um, for rural resilience and adaptation. Um, I see Marion is here. Are there other Marion? Would you be willing to give any update, or are there any other members of the subcommittee who've been participating? there or is the main thing on the municipal vulnerability index? I'm happy to give an update, but I know Jared has been participating as well. Oh, right. um, so I can start and Jared can fill in. Um, the subcommittee has met uh, two weeks ago on the second, and that was the first time in a couple of months. Um, they've been sending uh, sort of email updates on task group work in lieu of meeting um, if there isn't really important business to take up um, at an in-person or, or I guess online in-person meeting on Teams or on Zoom. But they met on the second. There were sort of two agenda items that they covered. Um, the first was a presentation from, um, I don't know, blanking on his name, but he works for um, 
uh, UVMC grant program, and they are launching a new, what they're calling environmental hazards resilience program. So really focused on flooding resilience and others in the Lake Champlain um, basin area, and, and particularly with communities that sort of abut Lake Champlain. Um, and he, uh, they, Lake Champlain Sea Grant Program, have only really had about a half a staff person dedicated to that work thus far, but are finalizing an interview to actually hire an environmental hazards um, educator, is what they're calling it. Um, so to really focus on working with communities in the Lake Champlain um, Basin uh, to, to educate on flood resilience um, and sort of help connect partners through um, existing partnerships within the UVMC grant program. Um, that was uh, Gary Dezeal was the presenter for that. And then the second half of the meeting um, focused on the Municipal Climate Toolkit, which is sort of the other task group that has a lot of uh, work going on um, in the space of resilience in addition to the Municipal Vulnerability Index. Um, we focused on uh, sort of engaging with subcommittee members around um, uh, what am I calling it? I'm sort of where to start checklists. So as community members, municipalities, which is what this toolkit is focused on, start to engage with the toolkit that maybe don't know where to start. Are there uh, sort of steps we can provide them to say you're a community and you're interested in learning or taking action on reducing your emissions or increasing your adaptation resilience to climate change? What are some of the easy steps you can take for those that may feel overwhelmed um, as they start to think about taking municipal action on climate change? So we bring from that, and that work's actually continuing with the Municipal Climate Toolkit Task Group as well, um, which has participation from uh, Rural Resilience, from Just Transition Subcommittee, and from Senate Committee as well. So those are the key updates for the Rural Resilience Subcommittee. Again, they aren't meeting too frequently. Often our, our some email updates in the meeting, but, but did meet on the second. And feel free to jump in if I'm missing anything. Yeah, that was an excellent overview. Thank you, Marion. Does anybody have any um, questions or thoughts on that that update? Okay. Um, uh, maybe just transitions. I see Claire is here. I don't think Kashka is with us today. I don't see Kashka. I can give a short update. Um, the subcommittee met last month, although it was a, ended up being an informal meeting since we didn't have a quorum. Um, so just, I, but I think sort of the broad strokes of what's coming out of those subcommittee meetings is that the subcommittee is trying to formalize its new scope of, not maybe not scope of work, but kind of mission in the period between the cap being adopted and now that we're in implementation and sort of expectations and procedures for how that subcommittee will plug into the various aspects of the ongoing council work, whether that's through task groups or reviewing recommendations or um, helping craft RFPs just to ensure that the guiding principles that they developed are being woven into the sort of each aspect of the council's work on a systematic basis. Um, and, you know, related to Richard's update, I think this has kind of come out of the biomass task group experience. And we've had a couple members sitting on that task group. And, you know, the subcommittee is planning to look at those recommendations at their next meeting in early January to provide any comments um, before they go to the council, I believe. But I think that's kind of the general theme and the subcommittee is hoping to draft something more formally um, just so they have kind of a reference point and eventually I think that would be shared um, with the council itself and maybe other subcommittees moving forward. But I think that's the bulk of the update. I don't know if Jane has been missing anything, but that subcommittee not meeting this month, but or meeting early next month, beginning of January to kind of reconvene and again, look at that scope and also the biomass. Uh, recommendations. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Claire. I was just going to say that, in a way, um, you know, Chase has been deeply involved in the biomass task group. Chase Whiting, who is a subcommittee member on just transition, so he's been bringing that perspective. But um, there has been a, a lot of reflection on sort of like process for applying the guiding principles and reviewing recommendations as meaningful as ones that carry weight as addendums to the climate action plan like these would. Um, and so um, 
there has been uh, discussion that the whole subcommittee would like to apply the equity scoring rubric and really look at the biomass recommendation. So in a way, the meeting being delayed this week will allow Just Transitions to hopefully do that deep dive and provide a written sort of recommendation response around the recommendations um, to the council for the meeting. Um, I think the others are cross-sector mitigation and ag and ecosystems. I don't know if Megan is the new co-chair of cross-sector, if there's anything you want to share. And I don't know, Colin, have you been participating in ag and ecosystems or are there others? I have not. Okay. Just on the ag emissions RFP. Yeah. Yeah, they have Okay, they haven't, that's right, they haven't met. Abby mentioned that at the last council meeting. Megan, sorry, please go ahead. Oh, yeah, no problem. Um, I just wanted to mention, I, I'm i I'm not a, a co-chair of cross-sector, just a, a regular oh, member. That's right, that's um, but right. I'm, I'm sorry. Happy, no worries, I'm, I'm, I, I don't think there's much of an update um, from cross-sector, um, mostly because the activity in that committee was taken up by the Climate Council at their last meeting in terms of the discussion surrounding the transportation memo. Um, and but I, I, I can certainly give an update on um, the activity surrounding that memo and and what was adopted by the Council, if that would be helpful. I think that has um, been mostly what's been happening in cross-sector lately, at least since this subcommittee has met last. Yeah, I think Megan, for anybody who wasn't there for that council meeting and may be interested, if we can, um, if you have it handy, I can also look for it. it might be good to just um, paste in that memo that was adopted as an addendum to the cap. And also, since you have the floor for anybody who hasn't heard um, the very relevant update on advanced clean cars and advanced clean trucks, would be great to, to share if there's anybody who hasn't been following that. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, I, I've i been enjoying not thinking about that as much <laughs> lately since we adopted it. So it hasn't been at the front of my brain, but yeah, I can I can give a, a brief update on that. Um, uh, so we, ANR has been leading a rulemaking effort stemming from the Global Warming Solutions Act and the recommendations that were put forward in the Climate Action Plan for the agency to adopt um, four different rules related to motor vehicle emissions. Um, the first is Advanced Clean Cars 2, which regulates um, criteria pollutant emissions um, and greenhouse gases and um, has a, an electric vehicle sales mandate associated with it for light duty vehicles. Um, that's an existing program that we updated to, I think, most significantly incorporate a 100% electric vehicle sales mandate um, that will we will ramp up to and will be in place by 2035. Um, the second rule is called Advanced Clean Trucks, and that is a, a rule that is geared towards um, uh, uh, electrification of the medium and heavy duty uh, vehicle sector and requires auto manufacturers to deliver a certain percentage of electric vehicles in, in those vehicle weight classes, again, ramping up to more significant percentages, but not reaching 100% by 2035. Um, and uh, then we have uh, two other rules that uh, address uh, just criteria pollutants and greenhouse gas emissions from medium and heavy duty vehicles. Um, one is called the low NOx omnibus rule and the second is called the phase two rule uh, for greenhouse gas emissions from trucks and trailers. And um, so, as I said, those um, require uh, vehicles to be cleaner and more efficient and are kind of a companion um, policy uh, related to advanced clean trucks. And so so the, the Climate Council voted to um, adopt all of those into the Climate Action Plan. And so ANR uh, finalized adoption of those four rules on December 1st, just in the nick of time to meet the GWSA deadline. So so that is, is some really significant news. Um, we're, according to some modeling that, that Colin did for us, we 
estimate that the uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions realized from that program will get us about 30% of the way to meeting um, the 2030 emission reduction requirements in the transportation sector. Um, so that's certainly a significant reduction um, that we hope to see realized over the next several years, and we expect it to ramp up even more after 2030 and be a pretty significant contributor to emission reductions um, in the years to come. So, so that's, um, that's exciting. And then um, the, the transportation, well, I guess I'll pause there. Does anybody have any questions about those rules? Okay. Um, so, and I'll, I'll find the link um, after I'm done with my update to where you can find all the, the, regular, the, the rulemaking record related to those rules on the ANR website. I'll post that in the chat. Um, so the, the transportation memo, um, originated from the Transportation Task Group, which is a task group of the Cross-Sector Mitigation Subcommittee. Um, and this memo um, I, outlines uh, a series of um, actions, um, uh, or, or I guess they're, they're framed in the memo as, as next steps um, to address um, emission reductions from the transportation sector. Um, and I, I dropped the, the link to the memo in the chat, but um, this, this memo was adopted by the Climate Council at their November meeting. Um, and I guess I would defer to Jane to talk more about what the um, effect of that action is um, in relation to the original or the initial climate action plan. Um, but as folks can see, those actions include um, advancing the, the suite of rules that I just um, outlined, um, continuing to uh, ramp up our efforts related to outreach and public engagement um, related to the, the transformations that we want to see in the transportation sector, um, and then um, developing um, and, and implementing uh, the revisions to the EV incentive programs that VTrans is currently working on with their contractor to really optimize how we implement those programs, um, especially related to um, uh, lower income and historically um, underserved Vermonters, and um, also supporting the build out of, of our charging network, whether it be um, on state highways, um, for uh, multi-unit dwellings and also workplace charging is a priority. So um, those are, are some of the items that are outlined in um, supporting uh, EV adoption, I think specifically, and then um, developing a framework for legal jurisdiction to implement the potential cost and car, uh, excuse me, cost and carbon effective economy-wide policies or programs identified through the development of the carbon reduction strategy, which is, uh, um, I guess, an initiative that, that the Vermont Agency of Transportation is leading currently, which is required, um, it, which is a planning process required for the state to go through to um, uh, utilize funding that is available through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law or IIJA funding, um, which provides a significant amount of funding to the state to implement um, carbon the, a carbon reduction strategy in the transportation sector specifically. And then lastly, um, collecting and analyzing timely and accurate Vermont specific data, um, which essentially means uh, a greenhouse gas emissions reporting program that helps us collect more accurate and timely data um, for transportation sector emissions. I'll also mention that you know ANR is 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 uh, contemplating uh, this extending to. Uh, not just transportation sector, but also the thermal sector in terms of collecting data uh, from fuel suppliers of transportation and thermal fuels in Vermont, which will give us a better picture of um, the emissions caused from the combustion of those fuels that are delivered for final sale and consumption in Vermont. So um, these are these are all um, all the actions that were put forward in that memo, and as I mentioned, were adopted by the council. So, Jane, I guess I'd hand it over to you to see if you want to expand more on the effect of this memo. 
Um, I'm not sure I have much to add other than the really tangible action associated with the um, action plan that's very clear and resolute is the around the emissions reporting for the transportation sector as an actionable item right now. The other components feel more like reinforcing the good work that's in the cap already in the sector and then signaling the work that's still to come for around the sector policy that's needed for transportation. Um, yeah, so and, and Jared, feel free to um, elaborate more if you'd like, but um, I, that, that's sort of the way I see it. Sorry, I was muted. Richard, please go ahead. Yeah, this, uh, just to hang on, to a comment though on a small part of, of what Megan just presented. Um, at, we just finished the, uh, and posted the Addison County greenhouse gas inventory for the years 2017 and 2020. And I put a link in the chat to that. A, a really significant ongoing challenge to doing sub-state analyses of greenhouse gas emissions is the is to get substate data on the amounts of the, the so called unregulated fuels that were consumed by businesses and, and people and activities in my county. So I don't have a really a good measure of gasoline use, diesel use, fuel oil use, or propane use in my county and I have to make estimates. And I think the estimates are reasonable. But I would much rather have direct measurements than have to make estimates. Yeah, Richard, I think that's you know precisely what the 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 issue that we're trying to solve here is to um, to make it so that we're relying less on um, you know data that that we have to make estimates on as well, or that is you know, not as, as reliable. And I'm, I'll invite Colin to expand more on the issues related to the data that we currently use, but obviously uh, um, being able to utilize the data that is cur uh, currently reported to the tax department and the Department of Motor Vehicles for thermal and transportation fuels um, would give us, um, you know, a much better detail and um, accurate and timely data to use not only in the inventory, but also to, to track progress more accurately related to the initiatives in the climate action plan. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot to add to that. Thanks, Megan. But, but I will say, Richard, that I think at the county level, it, it gets even trickier than doing it at, at the state level, certainly. Um, and it's, yeah, we, we certainly need more granularity and detail at the state level to, to get it as accurate as we can. But, but yeah, trying to get it down to the county, we can, we can certainly consider that like in, in trying to kind of put together any data asks or, or this kind of reporting framework. Um, but I think you're certainly going to have leakage issues, um, but it, it may be, it may be a better estimate than than what you have now, certainly. So certainly keep that in mind. Before I came to Vermont, I worked in Florida. I lived in Tallahassee, Florida, and I did uh, three annual updates of a greenhouse gas inventory for Leon County, Florida. In Florida, a portion of the state gas tax is refunded to the county in which the gasoline was sold. And so the State Department of Revenue has to very carefully track how much of its gasoline and diesel tax revenue was collected in which county. It made it very easy. I recognize that in Vermont, the Department of Revenue doesn't have a corresponding obligation to refund part of its collections to the county. We don't even have counties really for this purpose, um, or nor, nor, nor to the towns in question. So it does require some additional data collection beyond what is currently in place for programmatic reasons, but it's important. Yeah, that's that's interesting and, and helpful to to hear about that framework in Florida for sure. And the wheels turning a little bit. <laughs> Great. Well, this has been, these updates have been really helpful. Um, just looking at the clock and wanting to make sure um, we have a little bit of time to just 
I mean, just start, just preface a, a social cost of carbon conversation. Um, but before we pivot there, is there anything, anything kind of um, lingering that anybody had a pressing question about or really wanted to share a comment about after hearing all of those uh, subcommittee liaison updates? Okay. So I'm gonna actually, oh, sorry, go, please go ahead, Elizabeth. Yeah, I jumped in late there. Um, well, I, my question is, um, at this point, you know, I'm a new committee member. I've, I've been out for eight weeks on maternity leave, so I'm coming back and getting my hands around this stuff again. Um, currently, I don't sit on any subcommittees or task groups, and I guess um, I should probably know this, but what is the process for um, stepping up to some of that work, or um, do I volunteer my time? Do I wait to be asked? Do I um, I'd like to help out in, in some specific ways if, if there's a need. That's, thank you so much. And I think that goes back to Jane's point earlier of it would be helpful. I mean, I think each task group knows its composition, but I don't know if as a council or as a committee, we all have eyes on the, the task group composition. In the past, what has happened is if there's a task group that's being formed that a subcommittee member has interest in availability, uh, in joining, um, it's it's kind of been who who volunteers. So I think certainly, um, if any of the um, task groups that have been discussed today are of interest to you, expressing that, um, you know, um, now or later to to um, co chairs or Jane, um, it'd be great to um, get you looped into any of those task groups where you'd like to participate and contribute. <clears throat> and I'd also okay, and sorry, go ahead. I'm just realizing I misspoke. I'm on I'm on this subcommittee, obviously. <laughs> so speaking of the task groups, um, anyhow, yes, thank you. And just to be helpful for you, Elizabeth, or others, I did drop in the chat just a graphic that shows the existing task groups and how they relate to the subcommittees, like who participates on them. Um, and it has all been like asking of volunteers at the subcommittees that folks who expertise or experience overlaps and want to be um, um, included in more detailed um, work related to implementation of the climate action plan. And so um, I think as the contractual work gets underway, especially if there's an area that overlaps with your expertise and it's something you'd be willing to help support, we'd really welcome your engagement. So. Great, thanks. Wonderful. So um, on the next agenda item, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen just for some context. Um, can folks see, does it say scientific underpinning of the climate action plan on your screen? Okay, great. So, and I will, sh I don't think I can share these links in the chat while I'm sharing, but I will um, do so as soon as I stop sharing. Um, but for folks who are newer to the committee, um, a big area of focus for this subcommittee last year um, was um, establishing a social cost of carbon um, for the use by the council and the state of Vermont. Um, and uh, so there were a few key recommendations that were made when we established a social cost of carbon. And just for a working definition, you know, the social cost of carbon is an estimate in dollars of the economic damages that uh, would result from emitting an additional ton of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. There are also social costs of other greenhouse gases, social costs of, of methane um, and others, but um, that's that's basically the, the idea. Um, and I, there were three key recommendations that this subcommittee made and that the council uh, then uh, affirmed, which was um, a, a set of values uh, based on models that were developed for New York uh, by resources for the future. And those were linked, this, this is basically pages 52 to 53 and four of the climate action plan. But you can see what those, those values are and it changes each, each year um, over time uh, given discount rates and, and uh, other, other kind of 
um, changes. So, but one of the things that I think is really important is that that social cost of carbon was arrived at um, after very intensive and comprehensive research that was done by resources for the future. Um, but that research has continued um, and that relates to point number three, which is we recommended that we should plan for updating of the social cost of carbon on a regular basis, taking into account new research that may be published on the social cost of carbon um, and application of the discount rate. So there's a couple of things that I've come across um, that I just wanted to make sure that the full subcommittee uh, is aware of. Um, and um, that includes, so and if folks who want more on this, um, I'll include this link in the chat as well. There was a full social cost of carbon report uh, uh, that Energy Futures Group uh, uh, provided for the council last year. But there were a couple of uh, key new pieces of information that connect back to those recommendations. So one is in September, resources for the future um, updated their estimate. And again, that was the original basis for, for our estimate, which was something like, what was it, um, $121 a ton uh, in 2020. Um, the, the updated value from resources for the future, um, I believe is $185 a ton. Um, and then just last week, um, the Environmental Protection Agency released a new estimate uh, of the social cost of carbon, which was closer to $190 a ton. So I just want to note that this research is advancing. Uh, Vermont's value uh, may be out of date given this research from Resources for the Future and the publication by uh, the environmental, the US EPA. Um, and so I think that this recommendation three um, really should come into play uh, likely this this year, um, I, I don't think that this is a conversation to to resolve now or even at the next meeting. But I want to flag it and offer to um, pull together some background information um, and think through how we could have a conversation so we could assess different options and then go through a process to use a more uh, current, up to date, and appropriate uh, val set value or set of values. Um, so that's the main thing I just wanted to make sure to surface during this meeting, but happy to hear um, from any any questions or um, thoughts from, from others. I wanna pause there and I'll put these links in the chat. Richard, please go ahead. Yeah, um, Jared, I don't know where I, I read an op-ed somewhere in the last couple of weeks that said that using the existing uh, social cost of carbon, that some of the recommendations that were made as part of the climate plan were not cost effective, that they were, they were gonna cost money rather than save money with the existing value of the social cost of carbon. Um, if you double the the social cost of carbon, the, those comparisons may no may no longer be come out in the direction that was uh, argued by this uh, this writer. Yeah. Can can you shed any light on that? I'm not aware of what you're referring to. I have seen pieces um, that kind of cherry pick a certain measure or a certain pathway and say that that's not cost effective using a, a social cost of carbon value. What I, I think is important to remember is that we um, commissioned and then approved um, a comprehensive set of pathways to meet our overall emissions reduction requirements. And those um, pathways were found to have both uh, on net economic savings for Vermonters and when you apply a social cost of carbon, that the total net savings and avoided damages of the pathways in the climate action plan was like $6.4 billion. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if what that is referring to is that 
there was a more recent report, the marginal abatement cost curve, which looked at specific technologies, specific measures, and how, you know, how, uh, what, the, what the cost per ton avoided would be of those measures um, and how they relate to a social cost of carbon. There were certainly some measures that would be the upfront investment uh, cost would be, or the, the cost of the emissions avoided would be higher than the social cost of carbon. But again, those were, those were a, a, a small number of the overall measures. But when you look on net and add everything together, there were significant, significant savings. Um, I would just note that, you know, I, I do think it's important to have uh, an, an accurate and up-to-date social cost of carbon and social cost of uh, other greenhouse gases uh, value. Um, but what we're talking about is, is more like a, you know, um, uh, you know, it's, it, it, we're talking about, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a doubling of the value. I think it would be, you know, an increase by about 50%. If, if Vermont ended up being in range with the latest resources for the future and EPA estimates, which I think we'd need to go through a process, see, are there other values out there? What's, what's the methodology? What's the assumptions? But I think that a, a lot of the conversation we had was we want to be following the best and latest science on this. And um, it's hard for me to think of, of better sources uh, to look to than uh, the US EPA and resources for the future when it comes to those questions. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that disquisition. I appreciate it. Um, I will try to find the piece that I was was coming only partially to the surface. I think it was from the Ethan Allen Institute. It's it's certainly consistent with other pieces from them. I will keep putting in the chat these links that I offered. I didn't finish doing that. Here is the update from the resources for the future. And then here is that article about the EPA. Um, so I guess my recommendation would be, I'm, I'm happy to kind of um, work with anybody else who may be interested to, to pull some background material together and, and maybe set some context in a, um, draft a, a possible kind of process for this committee to go through. I wonder if it's, we did have a task group that looked at the social cost of carbon last time. Um, and it, it may be useful to um, think about reforming that at some point over the, the next year, um, or sorry, as we begin 2023. So if anybody has um, any thoughts on this overall topic or is interested in um, uh, helping pull together some of the background information so we can begin that conversation in 2023. Um, we'd love to hear it. Secretary Moore. Sure. I just, I guess I'm curious, can you hear me all right? I'm just switch my microphone. Perfect. <laughs> um, just curious, sort of the, the the practical effect of this, and you know, kind of just wanting to be thoughtful about how much we honestly we take on the Global Warming Solutions Act. It, I guess, it has a criteria around cost effectiveness, and if if you see that as as playing into this, but thus far, a lot of our attention has really been focused on the greenhouse gas emissions reduction requirements. Um, and I think, you know, acknowledging there's a social cost of carbon is certainly an important consideration in, in thinking about the, the overall value of the initiatives we're putting forward. Um, but I just worry about digging into a very technical topic. I'll speak for myself in saying, I, I, I understand the concept of the social cost of carbon, but when we were asked to weigh in previously on the appropriate value and time horizon for it, I really, I'm well outside any ex particularized expertise I hold. Um, I don't wanna speak for others and their own expertise on this committee, but I'm just not sure there's a lot of value add uh, for us in weighing into this conversation right now, other than continuing to acknowledge that there is a social cost of carbon that goes beyond the upfront costs of many of the, the practices and programs that, that are necessary to meet the requirements of the Global Warming Solutions Act. Thank you. 
I have some thoughts I want to offer uh, in response, but first let's hear from Elizabeth. Um, <clears throat> really interesting point, Secretary Moore. Um, and I was going to say something, but I'll also add in, in response, um, just, but you know, we're at UVM watching what's happening in Burlington very closely for obvious reasons. And um, there's a proposal before the city council to set the social cost of carbon at $150 per ton. Um, so up a little bit from the state of Vermont, the research that led to that was done by the Building Electrification Institute, which is a consulting firm out of Boston. So there's another resource that we might look at if we decide to go down this path, but they have used it in, a, in you know, to your point about this being, um, is this practical, is this useful? They have used that number to set a carbon fee to um, really incentivize through their building decarbonization policy, incentivize renewable heating system installations. And if you, you know, as an organization, you decide this is not cost effective or you want to take a different pathway, you have this sort of carbon fee that is is a is an out or is an is an option. And and then the um you know the I don't know if it's revenue that's generated from that <clears throat> then goes to low income communities to help offset the cost of um uh the, the impacts of climate change so those are just at a very high level some things that are under discussion in the city of burlington and um the way that they're thinking about this question yeah i, I would just offer i i certainly um agree with you and sympathize secretary more about the amount of work ahead of us especially as a lot of these uh the, the, the task groups will have work on a lot of the outstanding contractual work that's going to be getting underway in the first part of the year. However, I, I do think it would be really, um, it would be not ideal at all to be utilizing outdated cost of carbon figures, um, whether, because I think that what we've seen is that um, the there is often reference to the established values that the council has set, whether that is by the legislature or by the public service department, which is, is using currently the same values and by the public utilities commission. So I wouldn't, I think that that's one of the reasons that we said that these should be periodically updated as the research and science advances. Otherwise we could be in a situation of using an outdated and inappropriate value for a number of years, um, which, could either directly or indirectly inform, you know, policy and, and programmatic considerations, whether that's policy making in the legislature, whether that's programs that you know state agencies or commissions are uh, advancing. So I, I I hear you and would certainly want to balance this alongside um, other competing demands and, and look at a reasonable timeline. But I do think it is it. I personally think it's very important that um, we update this as we have new high quality uh, research, especially when, you know, it's, it was really interesting to me to see um, that, you know, the, the value that we had based on was based on the process, the very in-depth process resources for the future was going through and what New York's values used. RFF has now updated that and it is, uh, almost exactly in line with what our federal US EPA value has established. So, um, you know, uh, while I think we should look at other research and know about other values, um, those those two data points from very uh, careful, respected sources suggest to me that um, it's, it, you know, this next year should be a time to, to revisit this. So we're not using an outdated or inappropriate value to inform policy and programs going forward. Uh, Megan and then Claire. Thanks, Jared. Um, I'll, I'll just note that um, we use the social cost of carbon values in the climate action plan um, as part of the economic um, analysis or the equation that we use to compile an economic analysis for advanced clean cars too and advanced clean trucks. And um, just channeling the rest of the team and the Climate Action Office, I 
um, I think that it would be helpful to not only understand um, what the value should be and, and how and, and if it should be updated, but also how it should be used um, and incorporated into analyses where we're trying to inform the public of the impacts of decisions that we make regarding climate mitigation. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'll just like admit that you know, maybe we, we didn't do it correctly. I, I don't know. I, I think we, um, we certainly incorporated it as part of our, our technical analysis and discussion in um, promulgating those rules. And I'll, I'll note too that in hearing from how other jurisdictions are using the social cost of carbon and their decision making, I'll offer the example of Colorado, which has actually incorporated it into um, a regulation that, that dictates how they conduct decision making um, regarding climate change and it actually requires um, the consideration of the social social cost of carbon um, in their decision making for climate mitigation and um, actually you know prioritizes um, policies that uh, show a, a benefit um, when you factor in social cost of carbon. So I just wanted to note that I think other jurisdictions are thinking about this as well. And so perhaps there's some good models to investigate. Um, but yeah, just the, the utility of the number as well as the number itself, I think is important. Agreed. Claire. Yeah, I just, um, a couple different thoughts. I mean, I think one that I agree, it could be useful just to have an awareness of updated research certainly is always helpful. Um, but also here, Secretary Moore, with regards to the amount of work ongoing and prioritization of what will be most useful. And I guess I also just wanted to note that the you know, department we do point people towards the research that was done in the year leading up to the Climate Action Plan as a reference, given that that was adopted by the Climate Council, but we certainly could still look to other more updated resources without a formal process here. Um, you know, our utilities look at social cost of carbon and some of their resource planning. We don't require that they use the, the values kind of adopted by the council. And we certainly point them to that as a reference, but I know they also look to things like the avoided, um, the AESC, avoid energy supply sort of research that goes on. So that's all just to say, I think, it's that there's value to knowing what other research is out there and considering a bunch of different options, but I think the kind of weighing of ongoing work and prioritization is worth thinking about as we consider a work plan just knowing um, capacity constraints. Although now that we have added subcommittee members, maybe that will help spread the burden of some of that work too. So. Any other thoughts on this topic? Richard. Yeah, uh, like Secretary Moore, I struggled with the task that we were being asked to carry out as a subcommittee last year. Um, but I struggled with it perhaps for a somewhat different reason, which was that I didn't understand how the people that come up with that all, all of what we were being asked to do had to do with discount rates and how long a time period we look at it, but we weren't given any information to my recollection about how does one arrive at the cost estimates. I mean, you know, one, one approach is to say, how much would it cost to generate the same amount of energy without releasing any greenhouse gases? So, you know, if, if, if you, Instead of burning uh, fuel oil, you used uh, wind energy. How much would how much would you how much would it cost you, or how much would you save by by making that transition? Another approach has to do with trying to estimate the actual damage that the greenhouse gases that you're releasing is causing over a five year, ten year, twenty year, thirty year period. And I just I just never heard I never heard a clear presentation of what the raw data were that went into the calculation of the social cost of carbon. All the, all our decision-making was way down the road, way beyond that. And if we're gonna revisit this question of social cost of carbon, I would really like to ask the people that are 
presenting their methods to go back to the raw data. How do they go about making the the primary estimates that then get adjusted with with uh, with these with these uh, interest rates uh, um, discount rates discount rates yeah I, th I think that there's a there's a lot of detail on the methodology and the research that goes into establishing those values um, in the the background materials from resources for the the future I think that my recollection of that conversation was a lot of that research has has been done and established and folks who want to look at it can but then there was this kind of uh, question of well, the final piece is the, establishing the proper discount rate to use. So that's where most of our conversation happened rather than going back and understanding how. Uh, but that, that is a great topic for further conversation. I guess I would just ask if there's anybody who is interested in um, helping to do some of the background research to collect some of the contextual information to further kind of frame and help inform uh, ongoing conversations on this, please let me know. It's certainly a priority for me um, and happy to discuss kind of timeline and process um, at, our, at our next meeting, um, but wanted to at least raise this issue as I was seeing a lot of these new reports come out. I will go look at the background material and the resources, future material, see if I can make sense out of it. Okay. Um, we're just 10 minutes behind schedule. Um, we have a spot for miscellaneous items or other items that subcommittee members want to um, bring up. If we don't have those, then we'll have extra time for public comment if there is any, although I think every almost everybody participating is a subcommittee member. Any other items? Elizabeth, yeah, please. Um, I wonder, um, I'm backing up here a little bit, but this goes back to Jane's update on the thermal sector um, work. I wonder, Jane, you said that, um, you know, this is in response to the clean heat standard being vetoed and we're going to take a broader look at different policy options. Um, I wonder if you could just kind of run that out a little further. So we'll take a look at different options for addressing thermal emissions through this, this um, kind of broad look at policy tools that might be available to us. And then there'll be sort of some sort of evaluation process. I guess I'm just, um, I'd love to hear just a little bit more if it's if it's possible in my efforts to generate more context for myself. And I would just offer Elizabeth that there are very different opinions uh, about that. And I, I would offer to, mm. to share some on behalf of, um, you know, uh, a member who is not a member of the administration who participated in that process on behalf of cross sector afterwards. I want to make sure that there's kind of a fuller picture um, offered, but happy to defer to Jane to start. Thank you. Sure. So, um, Elizabeth, yeah, thanks. The, you know, the recognition and appreciation that the clean heat standard is still the primary policy recommendation and the cap that that's still there and that the recommendation that was supported unanimously by the Climate Council. I think where, um, where the task group sort of diverged, and Jerry can further elaborate if I get this incorrect, is that the position of the administration was that in order to really understand if it's the most cost-effective policy, which was one of the questions put forward, you have to compare it to other scenarios. So compared to what is it the most cost effective? So there were six um, different um, sort of approaches to decarbonizing the buildings and thermal sector put forward in the RFP. Um, and then that will be further analyzed, analyzed and looked at through scenarios, um, whether or not the one 
could reach the decarbonization uh, requirements for that sector based on the GWSA alone or some combination thereof. Um, and um, I opened up the RFP, so I got it correct. But the six approaches, um, policy or regulatory approaches that were uh, put forward in the RFP for further analysis were expansion of existing policies and programs. So heat pump and other fossil fuel reduction technology installations through tier three weatherization programs and energy efficiency utility thermal programs. The second one was direct carbon pollution pricing. The third was a cap and trade invest program, either individually as a state or regionally, a sector-wide performance standard for the building thermal sector. So um, the proposed clean heat standard or clean fuel standard, um, and then targeted performance standards for heating appliances. And then at the last one was direct regulation of fuel emissions and or appliances. So sort of a um, command and control approach from the agency of natural resources likely. And so those, um, the hope is that we sort of move through a quick analysis of those six based on existing research and then working in collaboration with the buildings and thermal task group, we agree on what the further deep analysis is to look at and really review cost effectiveness. And I'll uh, find where the RFP is online and drop it in the chat because there was a lot of detail and thought into how we evaluate what's cost effective and to who in Vermont. Um, and that will be a really um, sort of important and key component of the analysis. Um, and so I'll drop that in the chat, but that there was agreement from the Climate Council wholeheartedly to move this process forward. But I think where things started to sort of um, divest at the 11th hour is whether or not to center the clean heat standard from the onset or do that initial review of the different policies and approaches and ensure that the clean heat standard really did rise to the top um, right from the onset. And I'm sure Jared will offer more clarity around sort of distinction of opinion there. But that was the, the approach that um, the administration really felt like we had to look at all of those in order to stay cost effective compared to what. Um, and so that's moving forward now. Um, and then I think married with the idea of looking at fuels data and emissions reporting, hopefully um, if a policy does not move forward this legislative session, we're still advancing um, around our decarbonization goals by standing up what we know is needed for any good policy, which is the data. Um, you'll recall in the clean heat standard um, discussions last year, that wouldn't have gone into effect right away it would have um, required us to collect data on the fuel dealers first before we then started to regulate them. So if we can start to move the needle while also sort of refining the analysis and understanding of the best approach, hopefully we're not losing time. Um, and that's, that's the administration's approach to it right now. And I'll drop the RFP in there and Jared, you're help, happy to hear you clarify or further elaborate on um, distinctions there. Thanks, Jane, and thanks for the question, Elizabeth. I'll try to be really quick because I want to leave um, time for any public uh, comment that, that we may have. Um, I think that the concern, certainly that I had, um, I'll, I'll just speak for myself, but I but I know that you know th this was brought up by other folks in the task group that that looked at this and on the cross sector mitigation subcommittee, um, is wanting to make sure that we are. Um, that, that we are meeting our, the charge that was given to us in the Global Warming Solutions Act, that we have a legal requirement to um, achieve uh, emissions reduction requirements that the law says shall be met and to do so in a way that is as cost-effective and equitable as, as possible. And so the, the, what we understood to be the original intent of this RFP was to answer some very specific questions um, about um, the economic impacts and the net costs and savings. It's very important. That's what was shown originally was net savings as a result of uh, these investments in this transformation, even though so much of the conversation tends to go to the cost side, um, specifically of the recommendation that was made by the council, which was the clean heat standard. And I think the concern um, was that by having a proposal that would go back and reassess a bunch of policy options that were um, 
cons already considered by the cross-sector mitigation subcommittee and already considered by the council and found to be um, not able to meet the requirements and not able to meet the criteria that we had set around cost effectiveness and equity, it felt like there was a real chance to kind of go in circles or continually kick the can down the road rather than move ahead and actually work to make a decision with the best available uh, data. Um, you know, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm happy to see uh, information, uh, further information, but we have had scores of <laughs> reports over the years that, that already um, confirm the, the problems with um, a, a, a direct price on carbon. The goal here is not to just raise revenue and then have the government spend it. Um, so, you know, there are real problems with a carbon tax, which is why the, um, both in terms of inability to confidently reduce emissions and because of equity concerns, if not structured carefully, which is why uh, I believe that the cross-sector mitigation subcommittee in the council uh, never suggested a, 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 um, a carbon tax. Um, there are also significant concerns with asking uh, our regulated utilities to shoulder even more of the burden and therefore even more of the cost of compliance of decarbonization. If you know another one of those six approaches that Jane mentioned was expanding tier three, the idea of um, obligating utilities of our cleanest energy source to uh, invest more money and therefore have to pa pass that on to rate payers and therefore increase our cost of electricity relative to fossil fuels at exactly the time when we are trying to help keep electricity costs low so that people can switch not just to reduce emissions but to save money. Um, you know, it just feels like a number of these are kind of straw people arguments that we've already considered and discounted. So the utility of spending a lot of time understanding policy options that are that are not good uh, from uh, a practical effectiveness or from an equity standpoint uh, seems a little lost on me. If we want to just stand them up there to say, well, here's why our performance standard was chosen in the first place and why it's so much better, then, then fine. Um, but I just want to make sure we don't spend too much time on that because um, the council didn't recommend that we examine six different approaches. The council recommended that we pass and implement a clean heat standard. So uh, I, I think we need to be aware of continually going in circles rather than making progress to meet our, our legal requirements, do so in a way that advances cost effectiveness and equity and proceeds a, a pace rather than continuing to delay. That's, that's my personal opinion. Uh, so you've heard a couple of different perspectives on that issue now. Um, so at this point, I want to make sure we reserve time for public comment if anyone has it. Steve, yes, please. Hi. Uh, thanks. Uh, it's been a great discussion today. A lot of a lot of good work. Uh, I would. I have a couple of couple of things uh, to, to add to your discussion. I, most of the things that I had thought I might comment on, other people on, uh, on your committee have already brought up, so I appreciate that. Um, one, one point I'd like to uh, raise about the Clean Heat Standard and the, the, uh, the study that's looking at the, you know, comparing uh, options there. Um, one of the things that came up for me with that clean heat standard last year as a huge question that I, I really couldn't find answered anywhere was um, really how the money flows in that system. You know, what's the cost of a clean heat credit? Who's gonna pay for it? How does it get passed along? How does that impact? What happens when you have an increasing uh, requirement for creating clean heat standards and a decreasing volume of fuel being sold to spread that cost over? What happens to that, and 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 what happens to the dealers and the and their customers, and you know as those costs come out over the years, and and that was a, a I think that it's a little different than the net savings or costs of a program. It's like actually how does it play out, uh, and and I had uh, quite a few concerns about that, uh, but I'm pretty ignorant about it, and it would be great to um, see that 
really uh, looked at closely. I don't know if that if, if that's part of the study, but I sure hope so because uh, it it uh, I think there are real legitimate concerns there. I I you know I, I really want to see us get out of the fossil fuel business in Vermont, but at the same time. Um, that affects those dealers. And really that means it affects those customers, which are like what four out of, you know, so many people in Vermont are, are those customers. So I'd be very concerned about, I am very concerned about how that f- plays out in, in detail, not in net, in overall scope. Um, um, so that was one point I wanted to make. Uh, the other, and this is about the social cost of carbon. I think the point was kind of made by people in the discussion, but I think it would be really valuable to uh, do some kind of inventory of where the social cost of carbon uh, plays out in state government. Uh, Does it have an actual regulatory effect anywhere? It's one thing to have a planning effect and say, you know, step back and look at a big picture and say, well, because the social costs of carbon, this this program nets out again at, at, uh, you know, X, savings uh, or costs, but, you know, where does it actually, does it play into um, PUC decisions about siting or about uh, setting fees and, and uh, uh, payments for net metering, for example, or, or any other number of programs? How does that play in? Uh, does it, does it uh, figure into an uh, integrated resource plan for utility? You know, there are a lot of places where it could play in to a regulatory program and actually have an impact uh, as opposed to just be a sort of academic exercise. So that would be great to see. Um, I feel that it should play a big role in the regulatory decision. I'm not sure it does. And uh, it would be great to see an inventory of that if, uh, you know, in your spare time. Um, so. Anyway, I, those are the main things. Oh, one other point I wanted to make, and I think this was made in the in the chat uh, by Claire and maybe some other people. But when it it would be really, you know, the the uh, energy planning that's done at the regional level is really important in Vermont, and having that transportation fuel data at the regional level, I would just, you know, I would add that that's a re- would be really really valuable. It's one of I think it's one of the hardest areas to nail down. Uh, as, as you know, through my work on the energy committee in town here, um, one of the hardest things because it's regional and because, you know, it, obviously there's huge leakage issues with that, but um, it would be great to have that at the county level if that's workable at all. But anyway, that's all. Thanks a lot. Great work, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Anybody else have any any other Members of the public who aren't on the subcommittee have comments that you'd like to share with the committee? Or com- or subcommittee members, Richard, if we don't have I just, uh, I want to, uh, Steve, thanks for the useful comments. Um, the existing methodology for estimating uh, gasoline and diesel fuel at the county level relies on vehicle miles traveled, and the average fleet efficiency of registered vehicles. And so it doesn't take account of use of fossil fuels in farming or uh, or construction or recreation or timber harvesting where the where the fuel where that that don't generate any vehicle miles traveled in in the estimates that we have to work with. So there's a there's a significant gap there. else? Well, with one minute remaining, I'll just say thank you to everybody for taking uh, the time. Thank you to everybody who shared updates. Um, I think the next step is um, Colin and I will coordinate to to get out a scheduling poll to try to identify a next meeting time for towards the end of January and hopefully have that be a recurring monthly time that we can all hold 
presumably uh, around this same kind of time frame that we've had a couple of hours. Um, and I would, uh, as always, if folks have any feedback on the meeting, either process-wise or content-wise or suggestions for future agenda items, um, please don't hesitate to, to reach out um, to Colin or I as, as co-chairs. Um, yes. We usually connect a couple weeks ahead of time to draft, draft an agenda and certainly would welcome any input um, on that. So, sure. Any, anything else, Colin? All right. Not for me, Jared. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.